This is Stacy Eldridge. Welcome to Captivated. This world vies for our attention in a thousand different ways. But the most important thing, the preeminent thing, the essential thing, is to give our attention to Jesus. Welcome, friends. Stacy here. We're gathering together today to give our attention to our King, Jesus, the Worthy One, the mighty and compassionate Lord whose throne is above the heavens. He is holy and worthy and altogether lovely. His name is above all names, Jesus. Jesus means Savior. He comes to deliver us from the destruction that was ours. His compassionate nature draws us. His very name declares that he wants to come to every area of our weakness and pick us up and carry us. Christ means, as you know, the anointed one. He is the prophet, the priest, the king. He is the one. So every time we say his name, we are proclaiming his glory. Jonathan Edwards said, The beauty of God bows the will and draws the heart. So I just want to pray over our time. Jesus, how precious are your mercies, O God. We drink our fill from the abundance of your house. You give us to drink of the river of your delights, for with you is the fountain of life, and in you we see light. So we pray, help us to see you today, Jesus. See you in your splendor and your beauty, that our hearts would bow and our hearts be drawn. In your magnificent name, amen. You guys, I am thrilled to have on the podcast today, Rita Springer. Yay! Hey, (laughs) Hey. and Rita is... um, not feeling well and yet she's still joining me to share. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Rita is an eloquent communicator of deep things of the heart. She's a wise woman and a deep well whose heart has been captured by Jesus truly, honestly, fully. She's the real deal. She has chased Jesus and followed his calling. She lives a life of pursuit and intimacy. So I'm so honored that you would join me today, even not feeling well. Welcome. Oh, Welcome. that was mine, honestly. You and you and John are such true pillars of the representation of mothers and fathers. And it's an honor actually to to even be in, in, in your presence because I'm I feel wow. like I'm in the presence of a true mom, true mother in the spirit. Oh, it's so mutual. <laughs> I love that. I love to have guests on this podcast who share from the rich treasures of their intimacy with Jesus. So, oh, yeah. so that's you. So most people know you as a singer and a songwriter and a gifted worship leader. I want to read something that was written about you online. It says, Rita believes that the joy of being a worship leader is to make those listening jealous for what has been found in Christ making Christ famous through the art, act, and physical sound of our worship is Rita's anthem, and her deepest desire is to see that arise in the body of Christ. Her motto is to make the Lord famous in whatever I do with my worship and relationship with Him. Ah, I love that. I love that. I love like sharing um, an intimacy with Christ that provokes people to want it. And that propels them to seek him. So Rita's released 12 studio albums over the last 25 years. A long and time. my soul, is it 25 years? How did that happen? Five years. I know it goes by fast. It does go by fast. And my soul has camped in so many of them. The last few years, John and I have been blasting the song Never Lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've never lost. It. Oh my gosh. It has been our anthem. And currently, I'm in Thy Kingdom Come. Yeah, yeah. So good. And you talk about being, me being a mother. Well, um, Rita is the mother to her son, Justice. But you are also 
in the kingdom, you are a mother of many. Yes. Um, my verse growing up or in my, I call them my coherent years because I don't think as a teenager, you're that coherent. <laughs> but <laughs> when I started maneuvering, because I have a teenager, I can say that. Um, <laughs> but when you start maneuvering into, you know, those early 20s, you know, mid 20s where you're like, I think I'm called to this. I think God's calling me to something. And you start getting serious about it. I felt like the Lord gave me Isaiah 54, single barren woman, you who never bore a child for greater are the children of the desolate. Mm. She who has a husband. And I, you know, that's what a majestic verse, but I don't think I realized because it was even, you know, those things where you, you feel like God gives you something. And then a couple months later, or maybe a year later, somebody prophesies over you the same verse. Yes. And then yes. you kind of bank it in a Rolodex five, huh? And then something else happens and you see Isaiah 54 somewhere. So I really started to just sit in it and try to figure out what the Lord was saying. And never did I ever think for a moment I'd never bear a child or get married or have my own desires fulfilled. Uh -huh. um, and I never thought reading it that I would be a spiritual mother to many. You know how it says in all her sons. Yes. So I, I was just like, well, okay. And then it goes on to talk about stretching your, your tent pegs and, and allowing yourself to be filled for greater works you're going to do. And, and all your children will be, you know, blessed of the Lord. And I just was like, oh yeah, this is great. And then I realized the journey was how do you sing like you have something when you don't? <sighs> And how do you, how you still do what God's asked you to do when he won't fulfill your own desire? And so being a mom to justice by way of adoption, obviously for me, it was, you know, coming into motherhood was a beautiful, what a beautiful calling. But even in that, when the Lord called me to adopt, I was like, oh, this is how he's going to get, bring my husband. Like, this is how he's going to do right. that. I've got it. This is like Isaac walk him up the mountain, lay him on the altar and just say, yes, Lord, I'll do anything for you. Even adopt a baby by myself. And, and then surely God will turn and say, no, I've provided a ram, you know? So here I became a mother by way of adoption and then just got wrecked for the orphan and wrecked for the spirit of adoption mm -hmm. and realized that justice actually was more than ever physically birthing a child. And so it, I've been on kind of a wild ride. I mean, it's so funny because people will come over that's never been over to my house. And they'll be like, why do you have a high chair? Why do you have play pins? Why do you have toys everywhere? It's like, because my kids have kids, you know? And so oh, all yes. of these you know, young artists and writers and just people that I've mentored, especially here in Nashville, you know, they'll come over for dinner and they've got babies. So I feel like I'm this grandma to all these all these beautiful kids, but the Lord never responded to me to ever physically be able to right. bear a child. So it's right. kind of wild how God will take a verse and plant it in your heart. And so I'm he a mom of many. You are. And then he brings <laughs> it into fruition in so many ways. I have three sons. Yeah. And I remember um, when a woman ahead of me said, God brings daughters in all kinds of ways. Yeah. And, and he has, he's brought daughters and more sons and, um, and I love it. Yeah. But, but what you mentioned before about how do you sing yeah. when the promise isn't fulfilled yet? How do you hold on in the waiting, proclaiming that he's good when you haven't actually seen it yet, but believe you're going to see it in the land of the living? Yeah. You know, I mean, that verse was so perplexing for so long that, you know, sometimes um, our sweet humanity cannot fully retain God's divinity when he speaks. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, when God speaks, there's all of this filter that we have that kind of, God always will speak clearly, but by the time it gets to us, sometimes it sounds like Charlie Brown's parents. <laughs> my mom, you know? my mom, my mom. <laughs> yeah. And you're trying to decipher, or it's like a game of telephone, you know, yes. where God saying something and by the time it gets to you, you're like, you want me to do what at Walgreens? <laughs> So, so I think the journey has been to try to minimize what's clogging that conduit between how the Lord talks and yes. how to listen. And the, the more that I don't have distraction, the more that I am pressed, you know, with my ear against the chest of the Lord, I can hear clearly, but we hear in part, we see in part, right? So I, I wrestled with it for a long time. And finally, one day I was like, can you just tell me, like, what's the secret here? I'm trying so hard to be valiant. I'm trying so hard to trust in you. And my enemies seem to prosper 
but my humility and my honor seemed like you just turned the other way. And he just said, well, you've missed it. It's right there. It's sitting right there at the beginning of the verse. And I just looked down at the, at the verse and it said, sing. Oh my goodness. And I just was like, sing. He's like, sing, oh barren woman, you who never bore a child. Oh, the great oh. Children of the desolate, she has husband. And I realized you want me to make a noise. Like you want me, you want me to worship. And he said, when you worship, you break all of the strongholds around you that say, I'm never, I'm not going to, you know, I'm avoiding you. All those things that the enemy wants you to believe, but you've been given a, the gift to sing. And when you sing, you break off. Um, yes. You break that thing off of you. And so I think it's when I started really just making a noise. And my writing changed, I think, a little bit because I was like, oh, I've got to sing. So I would find the peace in the worship. And I think it's why it's become my, my life. And I'm not talking going out um, on a plane and doing a night of worship at the church and blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about swinging your legs out of bed in the morning and making a choice to be like, God, I choose you with all the worry, with all the, I choose you. I I'm still here. I'm still, you know what I'm saying? I do. So for me, that was the, that was kind of the secret. And all of a sudden that verse then became this tender, precious gem that I was like, wow. I mean, what an impactful piece of scripture and what a gift from the Lord to say, this is yours. This is, mm. this is your story, you know? Mm. So. And that's really where the gold is. It's in the hidden places. It's the choice that you make in the moment to go, ah, oh, Jesus, you first. And I don't want anything in the way. I want to gaze on you. Yeah. It, it, it feels like that level of passion, intimacy, and trust, really trust mm -hmm. in, in, in God is almost, that's not, that's not the end thing right now. You know, it's like a, a rare piece of art that hangs on the wall of a gallery and people walk by and I'm like, oh, wasn't that era just amazing when people were like that? And I'm, I've noticed that more because I'm around so many young people uh -huh. and while there are, you know, just being down in California this past week with the circuit riders, it's like, oh, these guys get it. You know, these mm. guys get it. But mm. I work in an industry and in a lot of churches where we're just kind of going to church, checking boxes off. And when I start to talk about just even hearing the voice of God, some of these young people are like, how would I ever hear the voice of God like that? As oh, if goodness. it's just like unobtainable, I'm going to have to be wounded and suffer like she did. And I'm going to have to, and that, oh, that's just too much to do, you know? So it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a very interesting day to be alive right now. It really is. It really is. I've been thinking about in my own heart when I, I can feel like I've gone cold where I'm not the, the zeal and the passion. I want to go spend time with Jesus where it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that it's just times where I've taken my gaze away from who he is and his beauty. And, and, you know, we sink into this world. So what I, I love is like, no, to be able to present, to allure with this fragrance of worship that, you know, we bring his presence where we go to go, no, he is available. He is available and he's better than anything else. So come, come, keep, you know, the invitation to come and drink, come and feast. You don't have any money. It's still. Yeah. You know, I remember um, years and years ago hearing this story. I believe it was at Southeastern University, um, probably back in the 90s, but it was their chapel service. Uh -huh. And um, I don't know if you remember Fuchsia Pickett. I don't. Um, Fuchsia Pickett was just a um, very wise, almost like a Corey Ten Boom. Oh, wow. She was invited to come and speak at the chapel. And there's hustling and bustling and murmurs and talks all in the chapel. And all of a sudden, you know, this little old woman just walks on stage and she mm. just stands in front of the microphone and waits and everybody gets really, really quiet. Mm. And all she says is, who will keep watch with me? in the morning hours, in the midnight oh, hours. Uh, when I was hearing the story, it was like, you just could all of a sudden see these young people just stand up all over the room and just say, I will, I will, oh. I will. And sometimes when you carry it, you know, so much intensity, you don't really even need to say much. Your presence on stage carries the volume and the maximum of, of his voice.
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I remember that. I think about that story all the time. And I think there will come a day when I'm probably bent over and I won't have to feel like I'm going to have to convince these people. You know, sometimes I feel like three days a week, I'm talking kids off of ledges, talking uh -huh. them off of, you know, uh, mental health ledges and mm -hmm. homosexuality ledges and mm -hmm. ma marital affair ledges and suicide ledges. And it's like, at the end of the day, I'm like, oh my gosh, it wouldn't it just be great if there was just one thing you could say and the presence of God would fall and just, you know. Yes. I kind, yes. Of, I kind of look forward to if I continue in this gazing posture that all I'll have to say is something simple like, who will keep watch with me? And that's enough. You know what I'm saying? I do. I, I get chills. You just say that sentence and I feel the weight of it. Yeah, to be so steeped in the presence of God that he, it just infuses. So, Rita, when did you first fall in love with Jesus? Well, I mean, I had the privilege. I call it a privilege because whew, the conversations I have with kids nowadays, with the problems with their parents, I'm like, wow. I had the privilege of being in a family with parents that, yes, they were pretty religious. I think they were, they were raised, you know, it was the Easter Sunday church going yes, family. Yes. And my parents were both from Columbus, Ohio area. And they ended up meeting in Southern California. And my mother was a very quiet, honoring, submissive, beautiful artist. And my dad was a renegade, hot button, ex-sailor. And he, when he got infected with the Lord, he just <laughs> wanted to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't even know where his conversion story is, but you know, Fuller Seminary is down there in Pasadena, Glendale area. So he wanted to go to theology school and seminary. So he had a master's in English and a minor in music. He was a trumpet player and then ended up getting his theology degree at Fuller Seminary. So, and that was kind of in the 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. So we were in the Jesus People movement. Awesome. And he caught that train. You know, my dad mm -hmm. was the kind of guy that would catch any train that came in. So, <laughs> but he, he was a very smart guy, but didn't. Um, didn't want to work because he thought you had to sell everything and give it to the poor. Oh, and so okay. we lived in campgrounds. Uh, we lived praying that groceries would be delivered to our, our Wow. Area. Wow. So it was a very, very poverty, very how, kind of How old are you now? I want to get a picture. Of I that. mean, I'm, I'm four, five, six what? years old. Yeah. So we're wow. living in campgrounds. And, you know, I was known in the kindergarten as um, the campground smoke girl. Oh, because I reeked of campground smoke, mm -hmm. you know, fire smoke. But he he had such passion for the Lord. And I have to admit, you know, there were six of us. So we all have different stories. Sure. Yeah. And I remember we went to this little church somewhere in kind of a small town called Pear Blossom in California. And I remember raising my hand to receive the Lord at about five years old. And they gave you that book. You'll remember these books. It was just the colored pages. Oh, yeah, yeah, first, just, yeah, yeah, I remember. yeah. First page is black, you know, then the red page, just a right. white page, and then there's a right. gold page. And, and then they, remember when they used to pass out tracks when you got saved? <laughs> so those, those tracks that evangelists used to pass out on the street to drug addicts and stuff. So I got my little track on like, uh, you've just gotten saved. You've just received Jesus in your heart. Now what do you do? And I just took it seriously. But I think yeah. I, I was, my personality was, man, my dad gives 100% to this. I think now he probably would have been, been diagnosed as bipolar mm -hmm. because he just was like, he'd go up and he'd go down, he'd go up and he'd go down. Yeah. So when he was on, he was on. So I think we lived, you know, he would gather all six of us in the living room before we all went off to school and he would circle us like a horse. Oh my goodness. He would, he would be like, Shandarabakasar. I mean, he would like speaking in tongues around us and, and calling us to evangelize and prophesy on our school campuses. So we'd have this long trek to the bus stop and we would all just be like petrified. It was like, are you going to witness? No, I'm not do that. So we would come back with these fake reports of these fake salvations that we had. Oh gosh, that's a lot of so pressure, <laughs> right? <laughs> pressure yes. horrible. But there was something about that one that I reflect on that. I'm like, boy, I love that passion. Mm, the passion and is awesome. He got cancer probably when I was about seven or so. He got uh, stage four cancer. 
And of course, God was going to heal him. It was the name of the claimant season. You know, we were praying and believing. And, and he actually pulled me aside by myself in a room and said, you know, I've got a really bad cold called cancer. But the Bible says, if you pray for me, God's going to heal me. And so when you're seven and a half, you're not like thinking, oh, this is not right what he's doing. Right. Like, you're yeah. thinking, hey, I've just been given an incredible commission mm. and I've got to finish this job. Like this mm. is my job. Mm. So um, when he when he died in the house um, at nine years old, it's kind of a really cool story because the Lord used it my whole life. But I was one of the six of us that I had to be in there. I had to know what cord went to where, what suction tube was where. I was I just wanted to know everything about what was going on and what were you giving him and I, probably the little nurse in me that you know the uh -huh. helper in me. And I would sit with him for hours. Of course, he couldn't say anything at that point. And I would just sit in this rocking chair next to him and just tell him about my day. There was something about losing him that I think he was my connection to Jesus. That whole, when you lose a father figure in your life, for me, it, yes, it was very damaging, but I always related having like a father um, as the connection to the father. So my, my older brother, who was nine years older than me at the time, eight or nine years older than me at the time, we talked about this as adults later. We never talked about it when we were children. Sure. And he said, well, dad told me that too. Like, what did he say to you? And he's like, well, he told me that dad had said to him, oh, don't worry if I pass away, I'll come back to life at the graveside service. Oh my just, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> just watch for the uh for the casket to pop open and i'll come back in glory so well, what happened brothers, when that didn't happen well i mean my brother just said you know he's like when we were driving out of the cemetery i looked in the back window of that limo we were all in and the only thing left under the awning of that graveside service was that casket and i thought something something terrible went wrong so we were all primed as kids to believe in something so powerful. And honestly, it, it could have really just ruined us. And for me, there was a climbing back out of the trench with insecurity. But I just had a tenacity to find the Lord. And it wasn't a perfect tenacity, but it was at least a, I just was like, no, I'm not going to walk away from this. I'm going to hang on for a little bit longer. And then something would happen and you would get five paces forward mm. and then something would happen and you would take a couple of paces back and then you take mm. 10 paces forward. And so, cause I always say that worship is a progressive state, mm. like your, your worth of the Lord, your understanding, your acknowledgement of the worth of God is progressive. So, yes. you know, it's how high, how wide, how deep, how long that's a progressive thing. No one can figure it out. So that just means there's more of it to be housed. And so I just kind of kept journeying into this place where I was like, I wonder if God's like this. And I wonder if God would answer this to, to where I could just hear him say, hey, you need to let this go. And you need to let that go because this is where the enemy's doing this. And so my relationship with God may have started at five, but it was really this progressive. Sometimes I felt like I was in an audience, oh, like a gladiator thing play out where the Lord and the devil were fighting for how I would believe. Yes, yes. And you're just in the audience kind of going back and forth like a tennis match being like, the Lord looks like I want to stay with him. I want to stay on that side. You know, mm -hmm. those are my kind of humble beginnings. But what is so sweet about that is that because of that statement that he made at such a young age over me, my father, that prayer was not anything I really felt like I had any power in. And the first song that I wrote randomly one night in my early 20s was for the, the couple that I was living with, um, three-year-old daughter who was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I had gone to see a Paul Kane conference and I came home and I just wrote this kind of random little song and our church started doing it. I mean, it was just a course, really. It wasn't anything big. It was just called Make Us Prayer. And I wrote it for this little girl. And that was the first song that the Vineyard took and published and went all over the world. And so I just thought, isn't that interesting that the very thing that the enemy went after me with in trying to, to tell me I had no influence in prayer 
was the very thing that God actually launched my entire career with. That is so awesome. That is so beautiful. I um, had one last question, though. I would like to talk with you for about three hours. And it is, how is Jesus coming for you these days? How is he romancing your heart? I have this just, uh, I call her like a female C.S. Lewis or Maya Angelou or something. So when she talks, you're just like, huh? And you kind of have to break down and decode her. She's just a very interesting woman. There's nobody like her. But she didn't find the Lord till she was in her 50s. And she lived this really hard, hard life. Very abusive father. Her, her story is just phenomenal. She was over about a month ago. And, and it's just been a very difficult season, you know, in COVID. All events stop. And my, my income has always come from the church and from ministering to the church. And it was a kind of this really beautiful season. I'm saying that because I'm so grateful. You know, even yesterday I was thinking, wow, Lord, if, if COVID had never hit our household, I would have never been home in a place where my teenager needed me and that I would have caught things early on that he was struggling with that only would have happened because I was home. I was in it. And I wasn't distracted with a church and their worship team and their congregation. And, and so we were talking and she's like, how are you with the Lord? And I'm like, I, I'm great with the Lord. I said, I, I have a habit of, there are all these pile of questions that I look over at these questions and I'm like, why ask them? Because I'm probably never going to get the answer I want. And if he says what he's going to say, it'll be really beautiful and poetic. And then I'll just, this is my humanity talking. I was like, then I'll have to be like, yeah, that was so beautiful and poetic. And then be like really happy about it. And then never really get the answer that I really need. And so I was kind of telling her that she said, why haven't you ever taken Jesus to therapy? And I was like, <laughs> what? She's like, you need counseling. You need to take him to counseling as a husband. Like you need to get him into counseling, into a therapist chair. <laughs> And I was like, oh, silly, how am I going to take Jesus to counseling? And she goes, she calls the Holy Spirit the holding spirit. She said, ask the holding spirit to mediate for you. And I was like, what? She goes, just have holding spirit come in as you're praying. And holding spirit will bring Jesus in and let her mediate for you to the Lord. And I was just like, oh, for crying in the night. And then I did it. I just, one night I was laying down in bed and there's all these questions on the corner, you know, in this pile with this season of that. It's just been really tough. So for me, I'm a single parent. I write songs three or four days a week. I travel and I'm, I'm trying to do all of these things. So I've got 15 balls in the air at all times. And I don't have a husband in the natural that pays for our house or debt. Like it's mm -hmm. all me. It's all me. So my mm -hmm. biggest thing is, if I drop one ball, they're all going to come tumbling to the floor. Mm. And that's mm -hmm. probably the hardest thing with keeping this kind of conversation with the Lord, because sometimes I feel like I'm like, hang on, hang on. I've got, I got three meetings to do and I got to do this and then I'll come and I'll sit down with you and then we'll chat about this. And then, you know, sometimes I feel like the Lord gets the end of my day, not the beginning of my day. Mm -hmm. So I, I did, I took him to therapy. <laughs> And it was actually just this really beautiful experience. And it just changed my perspective quite a bit because I sat there and I just, I felt like the, you know, the holding spirit, if you want to say it, said to me, what's the first question you would like to ask the Lord that mm -hmm. is pressing on your heart right now? And I said, perfect timing. I don't understand the perfect timing of God. Mm. And I need to understand the perfect timing of God. And, you know, I, I'm having this experience because of as I'm closing my eyes and, and the whole Holy Spirit for me was a woman. And she leaned into Jesus and she just said, mm. she has a really valid question. Can you please answer her? Mm. And in that moment, I was like, the validity, like the, the, the yes. fact that, she, that I was valid, like my question was valid. I could mm -hmm. feel myself breaking apart. Like oh. I could just feel my heart breaking apart mm. with the compassion. And he turned to me and he just said, Perfect timing is very difficult to understand with human intellect because human intellect's first go-to is wrestle. Mm. And perfect timing is peace. 
Oh, yes. So because you wrestle before you get peace, mm. you buck up against the timing of the Lord constantly. And it blurs your vision to actually be okay with the process of the perfection of how timing's laid out. You know, it's that whole point of if God gave um, Elizabeth and Zachariah, John the Baptist, 50 years before he did, or 40 right, years before right. he did, Mary would have never been 14 and carrying Jesus. Right. And then we wouldn't and have so to prepare the way timing. of the Lord, all of it. Yeah. So I realized in that moment, I was like, I think, what he's pressing on me is to search for peace, to just search for peace and to learn how and why I wrestle first. Like I've mm. learned the practice of wrestle because mm. I've got 15 balls in the air and uh -huh. I'm, I'm a single mom and that's how I, I'm fighting this and fighting that, doing this and doing that, and running here and running there and trying to do this. And all of that's done in this chaos of, well, if I don't do it, Lord, who's going to do it? You know? Right, right. So right now, that's where I'm sitting. I'm sitting in mm -hmm. intimacy of trying to navigate my wrestle into a place of peace. Oh, I love so much about that. And I love that we can go to him. I've got this question and that it's valid. I love the affirmation of your humanity, your, your walk. Yeah, I've started actually writing down all of these encounters and they're just actually quite stunning. Oh, anyway. oh. So, yeah. So maybe one day I'll put out a little book that just is like meetings with the holding spirit, you know, or something. Oh, that'll be beautiful. And I know it's going to affect your songwriting as well. Rita, um, I know you have an Instagram page and, and I follow you on there. And I want to encourage you listeners to follow her on that because you write really beautifully and it's very thought provoking and goes deep. You put things to words that people resonate with in their hearts. I do. So thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're thank welcome. You. So um, friends, you see what I mean about this woman. And my hope is that this conversation was just the beginning to whet your appetite or to provoke you to want to seek more of Jesus, to start your day with the singing that's not in front of a crowd, but just in the quiet. I love you, Jesus. And to say, I trust you, even when that isn't what you're feeling. Like, go ahead. Go ahead. Read it. Do you have it in you? Do you think that you could just pray a blessing over the, yeah, sure. the women that are listening? Oh, great. Lord, I, I just come and ask you for just the redemption of Eve across the globe. That, yeah, you, would, um, that you would begin to redeem the restricted woman the abused woman, that you would begin to redeem the, the woman that's hiding underneath the carpets of the church because they don't feel like they have a voice. Would you just redeem the single moms that are so exhausted in houses and the ones who are struggling with illnesses and bad marriages and uh, wayward children? God, would you, would you redeem and restore the ones that are looking for jobs and careers and in school and trying to graduate and the ones that are planning weddings and those that are um, planning funerals. God, would you, across the globe, would you begin to um, just sound out over the redemption of Eve? Would you release in these next coming years such a redemption over the morality um, and the power of women uh, because Lord I know you love them I know that you want to captivate them because a woman is captivated by you she's unstoppable yes, in her God. tasks and she's unstoppable in her intercession and I just ask that we would become the kind of women that in our elderly years would have one thing to say and have that much power in a room to bring people to your throne and so I just ask a blessing on those that are in the middle of the wrestle and those that have found their sale of peace and those that are trying so hard to maintain and make it and those that feel like perhaps maybe um, you've abandoned them. God, would you show your face? Would you show your heart? And would you captivate us again, not just for the sake of the gospel, but for the sake of glory 
and for the sake of your name being spread and dropped all over the earth. So we thank you, we worship you, God, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yes, God. Thank you. Be blessed, friends. Until next time. Thank you.